I don't get the trend-obsessed people. I never did. What's so good about copying what's famous or what everyone else is doing that you start acting like a manic? Even today, when people are more obsessed over trends than ever, I still don't have an answer to it. It was back in 2019 when I was working as a cook at Popeye's Chicken and they released a new item on their menu, which was a chicken sandwich. For the first few days, it wasn't that popular since other brands were offering the same item on their menu, but something happened and the popularity went off the chart. I got to the point where my hands would get tired from making back-to-back -back orders and most of the days they started to sell out entirely for the day. As the popularity and sales started to break the charts, the customers started to get impatient, and it all started with using foul language with each other. Slowly, I started to get annoyed with all that shit that started happening inside the restaurant that sometimes I wanted to just walk out of there and tell them that they were welcome to cook the sandwich on their own. But looking at my financial situation, I never got the courage to do that. Anyway, to sum it up, it wasn't just me whose days were getting pretty shitty. There was a bunch of employees who would get yelled at by customers. The endless lines won't stop until we announce that we were out of the sandwiches for the day. Sometimes during the late hours, the right before the restaurant's closing time, people would get into arguments over the spot in the line and the situation would escalate to threats, exchange, and verbal abuse. It would almost end up in a fist fight, which most often staff and others present would have to come forward to handle. The chaos over the sandwiches only rose by the day, and the customers would go to any length to gain that trending sandwich. That day was the same as others. The only difference was that since other outlets were getting completely sold out as the item was limited, people from other places were piling up to the ones who still had, and unfortunately, our outlet was one of them. I was in the kitchen working and listening to all the non-civil noises coming from outside, which usually I was still not used to, when I heard some people's voices getting raised as if a fight had broken out. It wasn't something uncommon at that point since people would make a fuss to get the sandwich before everyone else, so we thought it was the same as usual. I was told to continue cooking, and a few employees outside went ahead to handle the situation. The only thing I was hoping at the time was for our place to sell out of the sandwiches too, so these dreadful days for us could come to an end. As the commotion continued and other employees tried to stop the fight, I was in the kitchen minding my own business, when all of a sudden I heard a loud thud that followed the numerous gasping, giving me the impression that something harrowing had taken place. I'm not a very brave person when it comes to a mob or several men getting out of control, so cowardly enough, I didn't dare to take even the slightest peek at what was going outside but other employees working with me did rush outside to see what was going on, and a couple of minutes later, when a few of them returned, their faces were completely pale. Did someone call 911? One of my coworkers, Amy, asked the other one, Bran, in a hushed voice. Yes, they did. Ambulance and police both are on their way. I just hope Simon's okay, because other than Charlie, his condition seems worse. His voice had genuine concern in it. I figured it was something related to the fight and guess our coworkers became the victim of it. What are you guys talking about? What happened? I couldn't contain my curiosity, so I asked. The fight that was going on apparently was got away from among the customers to the employees who went to stop it. You should go and see their condition. Oh, and by the way, the manager said we need to close for the day. Both of them turned to me before Bran said this. I hesitantly walked to the counter only to see the condition of the tables and chairs which were smashed, and a few people were holding forcefully three men down, while other employees were tending to Simon and Charlie. Charlie was sitting on a chair as his arms were bleeding, and he had a black eye which seemed like was the result of multiple punches as his lips were also covered in blood. On the other hand, Simon was unconscious on the floor, bleeding from his head, and his arms and legs seemed punctured as well. As I mentioned earlier, I'm a little faint at heart, so witnessing such a scene didn't go good for me. My stomach started to feel weird, and I was getting nauseous, so I ran to the bathroom and threw my insides out. I don't know why, but I started sobbing right after, because if I had been the one who decided to go and handle the situation, I might have been among these two. 
And even though I didn't, those two didn't deserve such horrendous things happening to them. I liked those two. They always helped me out when things started to get a little tough with work and vice versa. After I was done throwing up, I got up with trembling legs and walked out of the bathroom. The ambulance and police sirens were cured by now, and along with other people's arrests, my colleagues were taken by ambulance. I took a peek to see that people were starting to go their ways with disappointment on their face, some of them even cursing those who started the fight, since it came between them getting the sandwiches as well. I even heard someone saying they waited in line for hours for nothing, and it only wasted their time. There's no word I can think of such people who have no regard for others' lives. Here's someone who is trying to do their job to earn some money, got assaulted in broad daylight in front of an entire crowd, and they had the nerve to say that it hindered them. That day, I decided to resign from the place, and it was not only me who thought of this. Well, it was only right to resign when your life is getting threatened at your workplace, and the management is only thinking of the profits they are getting by such a chaotic situation. So that's what some of us did the very next day. Thankfully, Simon's condition got stable, and Charlie also received the proper treatment needed for his injury. While Simon also submitted his resignation after a few days because it was pretty obvious that he was in no condition to work, Charlie decided he would continue. We all supported his decision, and we're still in touch to this very day. I've decided to use my degree in finance and landed a stable job for myself. Who am I kidding? I've been applying for this position since I started working at Popeye's Chicken, but glad news that I finally got it. And the pay's pretty good too. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. My days would go by working at my home office and ordering takeout food for my meals, which I knew was rather unhealthy. But looking at my work as a designer, I had no free time on my hand for cooking a decent meal for myself. So as a result, I would always randomly choose between restaurants such as Domino's, KFC, Wendy's, and Popeye's. But I vividly remember it. There was no order placed by me that day since I was so busy with work, I didn't even have time to touch my damn phone. The designs I was working on were finally completed a day earlier, so I was thinking of taking a rest that day. But around 8 in the morning, I received a phone call from the head office that I need to make changes to all of them as they were appealing though. I was never the type to take criticism on work to heart, rather I would gladly work on whatever adjustments my designs needed and be happy to come up with something unique. After a brief discussion of what part of the designs needed adjustment, I got up from the bed to go and wash my morning face off. I took almost half an hour to freshen myself up before I headed downstairs to get a glass of juice for myself before heading to my workspace. Despite working overtime mostly, I had successfully avoided getting addicted to caffeine and was thinking of letting this continue in the future. It wasn't like I wasn't tempted to drink coffee, but as someone who had a diploma in dietitian, I knew what it could do to me once I started drinking it. Trust me, Coffee is way more addictive than alcohol or drugs since people cannot quit it. The moment I fished my juice, I rushed to the workplace and started to work on the designs. Coming up with new ideas, even for a few minor adjustments, was rather hard. Thinking about changing what I had already put together needed a few complete sets of sketches. So I took out my sketchbook and started working on new ideas while making the old designs as my base. Once ideas started to flow up, I decided to put them into action, and the moment I finalized a new design, I decided to send them and get approval if the new ones would be perfect for the theme. They seemed impressed with the new ones and told me to change all the designs based on that, since the theme for all the designs was the same. Coming up with new designs was not an issue anymore as I took the base designs of others and combined them with the new ones, creating each of them unique and all the while fitting perfectly with the designated theme. By the time I was done with all the sketches, it was already 3 p.m., and I had decided to eat once I was done with the final drafts, so I continued working. After 15 minutes later, my doorbell rang. I didn't want to get up and leave work in the middle, so I stayed still and ignored it. The bell rang again. 
It was weird since I didn't have any visitors at my place. Thinking there must be something urgent for my neighbor to disturb me, I finally got up and went ahead to open the door. Upon opening it, I noticed there was no one except for a box placed on the entry mat with a Popeye's chicken logo on it. I was sure I didn't order anything, but still, I picked it up and went inside. Looking at how much work I had left, I decided to eat it later, so I put the box inside the refrigerator and went back to work. I was still confused, thinking why would anyone send me food, or did I subconsciously order it while working, which was unlikely, because I remember not touching my phone after this morning's call. About an hour later, when I was once again absorbed in work, I heard my phone's notification in the distance, but since my focus was entirely on the designs I was working on, my mind automatically disregarded paying any attention to that. But I could still tell that my phone was beeping now and then, which was also pretty usual because I don't get calls from work as they know not to disturb me while at work, and I don't have any friends who could have sent me a message or anything. So I got to the conclusion that I might be getting spam messages, making my decision of not checking my device more firm. Anyway, I finished my work by 8 in the night, and sitting in a single spot for hours had made my body a bit sore and stiff, so I did a few stretches as I got right up after sending the final draft. As I was in the middle of loosening my joints, I received a phone call from the office informing me that the designs were immediately approved and they gave me praise for doing a good job. I interpreted their words as meaning I could finally take a day off and rest for the next day. After the call was finished, I noticed a few deleted messages on WhatsApp. As I counted the messages, it was somewhere around 12. I find this message deleting feature over the app to be rather irritating. What was the point of it if the other party was informed of this action and ended up wondering what it could be that they had deleted? But I didn't fret over it much and decided to eat the Popeye's chicken someone sent me. And as I opened the box, the grease on the chicken wings made it unappetizing. So I threw it to the dogs in the alley and ordered from someplace else. The next morning, I woke up around 10. And for some reason, the thought of checking if the stray ate the chicken I threw or not crossed my mind. And as I looked outside, I saw a rather nerve-wracking scene where the chicken pieces seemed untouched by any passing animal or insect except for one half-eaten bite. Beside the piece was a dead kitten, making it clear that she had fell victim to the possibility of poisonous food. It made me feel guilty, so I decided to bury the kitten. But before that, I cleaned the chicken from there so another innocent animal doesn't fall victim to anyone else's viciousness. I couldn't understand why someone would want to kill me. Who would have possibly been offended by me enough to send me poisonous food? And what if I ate it? I would have been dead in my apartment by now with no one to discover my body for days. Ugh. Even such a thought sends shivers down my spine. All of these questions were circling in my mind when I remembered those deleted emails. So I called on the unknown number, but it was turned off. I tried multiple times and it was still off. I didn't report the incident and nothing of that sort happened after that, but it taught me not to be so careless anymore. I avoid giving food by anyone since I still have no idea who it was that tried to kill me, and there is a possibility that it was not meant for me as someone might have confused the address, but even then, precaution is better than cure, or I would like to say death. There was this gaming channel on YouTube that was getting popularity these days through videos of Minecraft. The player who was uploading all these videos seemed like he was a pro, and I had just stepped into the gaming world, so I was following many such channels to learn more about the games. My name is James Willie, and I'm a 16-year-old sole heir to my family's fortune. My parents died in an accident, leaving their entire wealth to me, but temporarily, my uncle is managing all the firms as my guardian. I know he won't try to take my position, because there was a will that no matter the condition of any other single person were to take my position, the entire fortune would go to charity. So even he would not be able to do it, even if he wanted, because there were no loopholes in the will. I know my parents' death wasn't an accident, and they were aware of that possibility as well. I guess that's why he prepared for my safety in advance. As I was saying, 
I started playing video games and learning more about them. So the game I was into these days was Minecraft, and it was quite interesting. After coming back from school, I would either spend my time watching YouTube channels related to Minecraft or playing the game. One day, when I was watching the YouTube channel of the guy XS Gamer, who was getting popular through Minecraft, I noticed that he had never showed his face in public. Instead, he always wore different masks. It made me curious to find out the real identity of the gamer, so I watched every single video that he had uploaded so far, but his face was not shown in even one of them. I rewatched the videos multiple times, but could not find his identity. So I started to look for clues in those videos, and I noticed the fire tattoo on his left arm. There was another tattoo just near the fire tattoo that was hardly noticeable because the fire tattoo was taking all the attention. It was a tiny cloud, but I noticed it after observing him for so long. The next day, I was thinking about the Minecraft player in class and started to notice every single student, trying to deduce the possibility of someone among them being the player. I was in the cafeteria when I noticed some students talking about the game, which grabbed my attention. So I sat next to their table and started eating, while focusing completely on their conversation. I figured one of them was a pro player, and also had a gaming channel on YouTube since I wanted to figure out the identity of that YouTuber, I went straight to their table and approached them. They turned their head toward me and looked at me with a surprised and confused reaction, because I was the kind of guy who never talked to anyone willingly, despite being popular. Want to come over to my house and play the game? You can record for your channels there as well. As I said that, their faces lit up as if they just got a lifetime offer. They all nodded their heads yes in complete synchronization, which made me feel annoyed, but I still told them my address and invited them over for the weekend. Following Saturday, I asked my chef to cook the things that teenage kids would like, and he made some burgers, pizzas, nachos, burritos, etc. for them. They reached around 11 in the morning, and I welcomed them in. After that, I showed them my gaming room and the games that I had. They looked impressed with every single thing that was present in my house, and their expression seemed interested to me. So Carl, what's the name of your YouTube channel? I asked in a casual tone so that I don't look curious to them. It's Stinger MVP 109 he said in an excited tone. But as soon as I found out the name, I felt annoyed that I invited some useless kids into my house. But I didn't want to be rude, so I let them stay for a while. They had brought all their cameras and everything for recording the games while playing, and I let them. I exited the gaming room and paced back and forth in the hallway, starting to feel irritated and annoyed. I was thinking of kicking them out, but my butler suggested that I should behave like a good host. I went back in to ask if anyone wanted something to eat or drink, and they all said yes. So I ordered the servant to bring some juice and the food that was made for them. And as he was serving juice, he accidentally dropped the glass on one of the kids who was quietly observing others without getting involved in playing with the game. The servant started to apologize, and I asked him to leave. I have a t-shirt your size. Come with me to the room, and I'll let you have it. After saying that, I instructed him to follow me. I went ahead and opened my closet. I picked one of the t-shirts that I had never worn and handed it to him. As I did not like anyone being in the room with me, I stayed there and watched him change. And that was when I noticed a fire tattoo on his arm. I started to look closely and said, Nice tattoo you've got there. He smiled at my compliment and told me that it was something he had done a few years back. Can I have a closer look? I've been thinking for a while of getting a tattoo, but I just cannot figure out which one. I walked closer while saying that thinking I was interested in his tattoo, and he showed me his arm. That was when I noticed a tiny cloud-shaped tattoo that was hiding just below the first one. I smiled and said while pointing at it, I guess I'll be getting this one. Hey, what do you say about coming over more often to play games with me? I'm not sure how to start. 
I suppose I should explain how I got here. It's not a thing I ever saw myself doing. I'm not a highly trained super soldier drawn to combat or a tough guy in any way. Until then, I'd only fired a gun a few times, taking pot shots at cans and the like. My interests focused mainly on comics and video games like most guys my age. In high school, I was in the chess club and still play a lot online. When I began college, I caught the coding bug and that is what I focused on. I graduated with a degree and got a job with a small game developer. The job's been fun and my coworkers are really cool and smart people. A lot smarter than me in truth. Now up until 2020, I had lived on my own for a few years. Unfortunately, that year was a perfect storm of misfortune for my family and the world at large. In addition to the pandemic, my mother made the difficult decision to divorce my stepfather. She had finally grown tired of enough of his verbal and physical abuse to kick him out. She was now responsible for providing for herself and my 12-year-old brother on one income. In spite of the odds, she was making it. Then the lockdowns began and she lost her job. This was a disaster. As soon as I found out, I moved out of my place and in with them. I quickly sold what I could and put the rest of my belongings in storage. There was no way I was going to let my family get turned out onto the streets and certainly not while a deadly plague was ravaging the planet. The lockdowns were a mixed bag for us. My job was unaffected for the most part. All work switched off-site. The extra money I saved was put into food and other bills. My mother, who had always been very interested in vintage clothing, began reselling them on Etsy and eBay. At least on the financial front, we were eking out an existence. The good always comes with the bad, and my stepfather was nothing but bad. I had encouraged my mother to file a restraining order against him as a just-in-case measure after kicking him out, but instead, he still will be allowed to see his son. I considered other options, but it didn't seem fair cutting my little brother off from his dad. So as long as he played nice, I would mind my own business and avoid him when he came around. Fortunately, the lockdowns came to an end and we were allowed to restart our lives. I began working out of the office again and my brother returned to school. Mom quickly found a part-time job tending bar downtown. It was not an ideal situation, but a start at the least. My stepfather had to screw it up, though. He discovered where mom was working and began frequenting her workplace. Mom had more than enough experience dealing with his crap and took his provocations on the chin. As usual, he got too drunk and pushed things too far. The night he threw a full glass of beer in my mom's face, the bouncers threw him out in his butt. I wish I could say that he learned his lesson, but bullies are often slow in the uptake. I couldn't deal with the humiliation, so he waited outside of our apartment continuing to drink all the while. He sprang from the bushes and beat my mom mercilessly until she was able to escape into the safety of the apartment. I just happened to be away that night working on a last minute deadline. Had I been there to witness it, what came later may have happened a lot sooner than it did. I arrived late the next afternoon so exhausted that I could barely see, but the second I saw my mom's face, I exploded. I'd had enough. If the cops didn't do their jobs, I would do it for them. I think mom could see how serious I was and it scared her. I believe she came up with her plan not to stop the abuse, but to prevent me from ruining my life because of it. I was in the process of calling the cops when she asked me to hear her out. I was reluctant, but did so. No matter what she said, I still had every intent of making that call. She reminded me that the police had been involved many times before, but whether because of her reluctance to testify or just plain systemic disinterest, he had gotten off with little more than a slap on the wrist. Rather than call authorities, she proposed that we move somewhere that he was less likely to bother us. The lockdowns had put an end to any real reason for us to stay. Her original employer, along with many other employers in the area, had been destroyed. The school district, which had never been very good, was now in a shamble, and there was nothing keeping us there. I thought about it, and now that I'd calmed down somewhat, agreed that it sounded good. I may have had the most to lose, but I figured that I could probably work remotely. If not, I was sure that I'd be able to find a job using my skills wherever we ended up. And so the preparations began. 
That evening, we packed everything up that we could into their cars, and while we did so, I noticed Mom putting her dad's old Smith & Wesson revolver in her purse. I gave her a questioning look, but she quickly closed the purse and continued with the packing, and I kept my feelings to myself. The following morning, we rose up early and hit the road. We hadn't informed anyone that we were leaving, not even the apartment manager. Anyone who needed to know could be informed after we arrived at our new home, and even they wouldn't be informed of where. We convoyed for most of the day, only stopping for a quick lunch. About 6 p.m., we decided to grab a room for the night. I made an order for some pizzas. We'd been done eating about a half an hour when Mom got a text from my stepfather. I watched Mom turn dead pale as she read it. She just stared at the screen with her mouth gaping open. I grabbed the phone from her and read the message out loud. Did you actually think I'd let you run away with my son that easy? My brother and I stared at one another in astonishment. We both jumped up and ran to the window. I yanked the curtain back hard and scanned the parking lot for him. It was the worst thing that I could have done. He saw me first and began running toward the room. I yanked the curtains closed, but it was already too late. We couldn't do anything but stare at each other in dread as we waited for him to arrive. The silence in the room was terrifying. Outside, the sound of running grew closer by the second. A nauseating churning stirred in my guts, and I would liken it to waiting for a bomb to land and blow you to bits. I fought off the overpowering desire to vomit. Gradually, the clomping of his boots became a deafened pounding until... nothing. For a brief moment, we started to believe that we had been somehow saved. Mom crept toward the door and carefully peeked through the peephole and just as quickly jumped back from it. Suddenly, the door exploded open and off its hinges. My brother and I turned and ran, but it was too late for my mom. She had become trapped under the door, putting her well in reach of my stepfather. He effortlessly snatched her up by her shirt and began punching her in the face as hard as possible. Each hit slung mom's body back like a rag doll. My brother stood nearby helplessly begging his father to stop. I too could only watch as he pounded the life from her. There was little I could do. He was so much larger than me, massive and strongly built by years of hard manual labor, and I was left with only one option. The one that I had often threatened in anger but never imagined I'd ever have to choose. Yet I had little choice. He clearly intended to kill her, and if I was going to do something, it must be done immediately. Once I decided, the act was almost mechanical. I marched over to Mom's purse and pulled the pistol from it. I felt like that I was in a dream. It would be as simple as shooting a few cans. I pulled the trigger in three quick motions. The gun sound deafened me and a ringing drowned out my ears. My stepfather stumbled back a moment and then glared at me with the most amazed and shocked face. It's the craziest thing. I'm still completely bewildered when I look back at it. I think he honestly believed that he was going to be able to murder my mom and take my brother with him and get away with it. It's insane, but I truly believe he thought that. I was about to pull the trigger a few more times, but he stumbled around and collapsed just outside the threshold of the door. I carefully stepped around my brother, who was in a heap on the floor, sobbing. I nudged my stepdad's body with my foot and didn't get a reaction. I looked over to my mom, who was unconscious on the floor. Her face was so bad, and I was sure that she was dead. I stuck the pistol in my front pocket and ran back around to where my phone was charging. I unplugged it and called 911. Just to be safe, I placed the pistol back in mom's purse to make sure the cops didn't shoot me by accident. And while I waited, I checked mom for a pulse and was happy to find that she was still alive. Help soon arrived and rushed her off to a hospital. Considering the circumstances, I had to stay behind with the police. I told them what had happened and the history we had with the subject, and they repeated the same questions over and over, I guess to see if I changed my story. And they must have been satisfied because they let me leave for the hospital a few hours later. I was instructed not to leave the city until I was formally cleared, which was fine with me. A reason for running had been dealt with after all. They did take the gun as evidence, of course, and this bothered me a little because it had been my grandfather's service weapon when he was a sheriff and 
I assumed that we'd never get it back. In the end, if this was to be the price for security and peace, it was well worth paying. When I arrived at the hospital, mom was in surgery. The doctor's preliminary diagnosis was grim. Her face and skull had been fractured along with her brain almost certainly being enlarged due to swelling. There was also some concern that she may lose sight in one of her eyes. Despite the bad news, I was relieved that she had survived the attack, and the rest was in God's hands now. I joined my brother in the waiting room. He had to have been in shock. The last few hours had been an emotional roller coaster. Most adults live an entire life not having experienced as much as he had in such a short time. I sat and watched him for a couple of minutes. He stared at the TV keenly as if his life depended on it, and I broke the silence with an apology. I wasn't sorry for what I'd done, but I still felt bad for having to do it in his presence. He turned to me and thought deeply for a long moment before speaking. It's okay. He was an a-hole and he got what he can't come into him. I loved him, but he was a monster. I don't feel bad. Mom's alive because of you. I was shocked by his reply, to be honest. He was a very quiet kid and I never heard him voice those type of feelings before and I was at a loss for words so I gave him a big hug and let it go at that. Mom came out of surgery a few hours later and we were soon allowed to see her. I had tried to prepare myself mentally for what I may see but I was shocked nonetheless. Her head was almost twice its size and wrapped completely but for a few narrow tubes exiting it. I maintained my composure but my brother was a different story. He was a blubbering mess and I don't blame him. It was not a sight anyone his age should have to see, especially when it was his own mother. The next week was a long period of watching and waiting. The hospital was cool enough to let us crash in the room. I had also gotten us a new motel room so we could clean up or sleep in a real bed occasionally. Gradually, mom's condition would improve and she even managed to keep vision in her damaged eye. Nearly a month later, she was finally released. It was a day I had feared may never come and I was very emotional when it arrived. Meanwhile, as mom recuperated, the investigation continued. A few days before her release, I had found us all a small house to rent in town. It was beginning to look, at least for the time being, that this was to be our new home. It was a happy relief when the call finally came. After an exhaustive investigation, authorities had deemed my shooting to be justifiable, and I was a free man in the eyes of the law. The call came just 15 days ago, and I'm still somewhat shaken. I'm afraid something's going to happen to ruin our new life. Mom is improving by leaps and bounds every day. I've been able to keep my job working remotely, and my brother is continually proving to be an amazingly resilient individual. There is a small cloud looming off in the distance. Our lawyer has indicated that my stepfather's family has made threats of filing a civil lawsuit against me. He seems to think it's all talk and I can't imagine them coming up with the resources needed to mount such a long and pointless undertaking. They are all a bunch of aimless poor alcoholics and addicts that can't even be bothered to hold down a job and I remain optimistic considering my adversaries. I can't think of any more to include. The situation appears to be stable and I think the biggest of our troubles has passed. Our new home is a warm and inviting place full of kind people. I wish every place was this nice. Mom has every intention of going back to work soon and my brother has already started at his new school. It seems that after all the years my family has suffered, we may finally have come out the other side of the tunnel. The future should be bright from here on. My only regret is that a boy had to lose his father forever to get there, and that I had to be the one who caused it. <laughs>